And we are joined now by a retired officer and pilot stationed at Plattsburgh Air Force Base in the years leading up to the closing 20 years ago, Frank Berry. You were a B-52 and FB-111 pilot. Yes, I had the good fortune to fly B-52s first to get my feet on the ground in the Strategic Air Command. And then when the base that I was assigned to in B-52s closed, I was able to get approval to go through the FB-111 training here at Plattsburgh and we were able to select Plattsburgh as the two, one of the two FB-111 bases to be assigned to. The uh, connection here goes something back like this. In 1970, my wife and I got married. We were passing through this area on our honeymoon. I knew I was going to be coming into the Air Force at that time, and as we're driving through the uh, Lake Champlain Islands, we look to the uh, west and see Air Force airplanes in the pattern at Plattsburgh Air Force mm -hmm. Base. And just being in such a gorgeous location, we said, wouldn't this be a great place to be assigned? It took us seven years, but we got here. And you were here twice. We were here stints. twice. Yep. You retired just before the base closed in, in 1995. Yes, I retired in the uh, fall of 1993. Uh, the Air Force gave you the choice of where you could retire to, and so I always took the good side and decided to ask my wife Sandy where she'd like to retire to. She said, let's go home to Plattsburgh. And so we elected to uh, move to Plattsburgh permanently then in the fall of 1993, and we've been here ever since. So you were retired, but you were living here at the time. So yes, you remember 20 years ago when that happened. Yes, I do. What was that like? You weren't there for the ceremony that day on the Oval, but what, what was it like as the base uh, that closed down in, in late September 1995. Well, after the BRAC Commission selected Plattsburgh as one of the bases to be closed in the 1995 uh, time frame, we knew it was coming, so it was just a matter of time. Uh, as I mentioned previously in my B-52 experience, I was one of the last B-52 crew members to leave Kinchlow Air Force Base in northern Michigan, so I saw that firsthand a little bit what a base drawdown enclosure was, uh, was like. So as we came uh, closer to watching Plattsburgh Air Force Base close, it was a little disappointing to watch one facility on the base after another one closed down. And the process took the better part of a year once, uh, once the uh, process began as we watched first, you know, some of the hobby shops close down, then the commissary or the exchange, mm -hmm. the theater stopped showing uh, movies, people were getting orders away, you were seeing fewer and fewer aircraft uh, flying around here. You knew that you knew the end. Uh, the end was coming and was going to be inescapable. So it was happening in bits and pieces. It happened in bits and pieces. Not every not everyone and everything leaves on the 30th of September of the of that uh, year. But during the one year to six month uh, time period prior to that, you started to see the retrograde movement of stuff going away. You obviously had a lot of. Uh, uh, friends who are still here, a number of officers who you knew. Uh, how do they describe that day when the when the flag came down and that ceremony was held? Well, one of my uh, one of my good friends, uh, Pete Glushko from uh, Peru, who actually bought the house that we used to live in and is still living in it today, was part of the closure ceremony. Mm -hmm. I believe he was able to recount the Plattsburgh Air Force Base history during that closure ceremony, mm -hmm. and just uh, speaking with him. Uh, a few days ago here, um, Pete mentioned that, yes, he too was watching you know, things that he had been a part of our lives go away bit by bit as new portions of our lives would open up. Emotional, an emotional time for a lot of people. I would imagine so, I would imagine so. Uh, I was working in the uh, private sector uh, at that time and I don't think I was able to get time off to go to the closure ceremony. But because I knew it was going to happen, I pretty much chose not even not even to ask because I didn't actually want to subject myself to the formal closure ceremony. We could follow it in the news media, and that, that was adequate for me. Yeah. This came in a period when, uh, across the country, air bases were being closed down. The uh, Defense Department was uh, scaling back. Uh, there was the BRAC process uh, that uh, had happened in 1991. Plattsburgh survived that. Uh, but then uh, two years later was on, on the list once again. And even though a lot of people thought that, that it would be able to survive again, um, um, it, it didn't. And, and I think a lot of people discovered that it was a very political process and it really, uh, the uh, political delegations uh, played a big part in, in uh, weighing in on, on who should stay and who should go. So a lot of people were surprised at Plattsburgh was on that list a second time around and, and uh, uh, very disappointed that, uh, that they uh, didn't think that uh, there was enough 
support from political leaders and the political delegation to, to keep them from being closed. So was it, uh, 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 looking back now over 20 years, uh, is there uh, any sense of, of, of uh, resentment or, or bitterness in some people's minds that, that uh, at the time more wasn't done to keep Plattsburgh open? Well, I, I believe the entire effort to keep Plattsburgh Air Force Base open was one of the best organized and best executed efforts of all the bases that uh, either w succeeded in staying open or lost out and were selected for closure. I thought Plattsburgh and the um, Plattsburgh movement to keep the base open was one of the was one of the best done. As far as the political dimension, you know, the Air Force did not get to select the bases to close. They were um, required to close bases as the BRAC Commission uh, decided. Were, was it a political? Everything is political when you're looking to do that. From an operational point of view, having been a pilot here during two assignments, I knew what the flying environment was like up here. The Plattsburgh air, the airspace around Plattsburgh and the uh, northeast U.S. here was wide open for military training. It was a very useful place to train. The uh, base that did stay open and receive many of our aircraft, of course, was McGuire down in New Jersey, mm -hmm. where you're part of the busy, busy New York City air traffic uh, area. And uh, we were surprised from an operational point of view that a base that was wide open for training was selected for closure, while a base where uh, pilot transition training, that is flying your aircraft, doing touch and go landings, doing practice approaches, was more and more difficult. That, that was a surprising thing from the operational point of view. You mentioned uh, the area mounted quite, quite an effort, uh, made quite a case to keep this base open. And, and uh, a lot of people thought that, the, that they had done a really good job and convinced certainly the Air Force to keep it open. But uh, as you also mentioned, it was part of a bigger process with, uh, with the politicians involved in, in voting and, uh, and, and ultimately uh, Plattsburgh did not, did not survive. Did not survive the process, no. Um, for you, uh, how many years altogether were you here? Well, let's see. Uh, I was fortunate enough to have two regular assignments here from 1977 to 1982, flying the FB-111 mm -hmm. as a student uh, first in the uh, FB-111 uh, training program, then as a uh, bomb squadron pilot in the 528th Bomb Squadron, in upgrading to instructor pilot, and finally teaching other people to fly the FB-111 in the combat crew training squadron here. I left in 1982 for a few Air Force assignments before being reassigned back to Plattsburgh, also at my request, in 1986. Uh, during that time assignment here, I came in as a more senior officer, as a uh, senior major, and pinned on my lieutenant colonel rank during that time. And during that time, I was a uh, scheduler for the FB-111 uh, uh, squadrons and also the operations officer of the 528th Bomb Squadron holding that position until I left again in 1989. Mm. Two stints here, uh, both as pilots and then as an instructor. Mm. Not, only, not only that, during the first Gulf War time frame, mm -hmm. I and my family were living in Rabat, Morocco. I was working out of the American Embassy in uh, Rabat. During the first Gulf War, the State Department, as you could imagine, couldn't determine how the local population would react for a, a Mideast war mm -hmm. instigated by the U.S. against, against Saddam Hussein. So during that time, they pulled all our dependents, that is our families, out of Morocco, those of us who were deemed to be essential stayed. So my family was able to come right back to our neighborhood in Peru, New York, where we had lived previously and were able to rent a house two streets over from the house we had lived on about uh, a year and a half earlier. Mm. What are some of your fondest memories of your time here at Plattsburgh Air Force Base? Well, flying the FB-111 was just a treat for any pilot. You got to be the only pilot in the aircraft, and of course you had your navigator sitting uh, next to you, so you weren't the only person there, but being able to fly that uh, very maneuverable, very fast, very capable uh, airplane, not only here in uh, the uh, Northeast, not only here in the traffic pattern of uh, Plattsburgh, but also on several exercises. Our squadrons were often picked to go out to the red flag exercises at uh, Nellis, flying against very realistic ground threats and other air threats uh, that would uh, simulate Soviet tactics to, that we would be trying to penetrate against into Soviet airspace. So we got to go on um, several of the red flag uh, missions, but also we participated in uh, other uh, deployments. I remember during my first time here, uh, SAC went through a major training exercise 
a major wartime simulated uh, uh, exercise where we deployed uh, FB-111s and tankers to several bases. I got to take, I got to deploy with my airplane and navigator to Niagara Falls Airport in uh, Western New York. Mm. Buffalo was my hometown. Got to have my uh, some of the family members come out and see us through the fence. They, we couldn't bring them onto the base because we were simulating wa wa wartime. Then flying out of uh, Niagara Falls uh, Air Base uh, on a simulated wartime mission, then recovering back. During my second time here, one of my fondest memories, we did a similar thing, but this time we went to Alpena, Michigan. Alpena, Michigan is just a wonderful uh, Air National Guard base that uh, the um, Michigan Air National Guard has. We did the same thing, took, took, took several 111s uh, with us, several tankers with us, and flew for uh, two weeks some really nice training missions out of um, Alpena, either in the Michigan area or out to the ranges at Nellis, out to the ranges at Nellis, where we got to actually drive, drop live 500-pound uh, bombs. How much of a difference going from B-52s to FB-111s as a pilot? Well, everything happens a lot faster in a faster airplane. Plus, you were the only pilot, so you couldn't uh, really give full control over to the other uh, person in your cockpit. I liked it very much from uh, from that perspective, being the uh, being the uh, solo pilot. I also liked having a two-person crew with only one other person that I was responsible for than the uh, five other people I was responsible for in B-52 days. Plus, like I said, flying the 111, a much nicer, more interesting flying experience than flying uh, B-52s. Yeah. B-52s, built by Boeing, you could trust them. They're still flying today. Some of the airplanes I flew at Kinchlow are still flying oh, today. Whereas the FB-111 always demanded your full and complete attention. You could never really relax. You trusted the airplane, but not all that much. You had to keep, you had to keep your eyes on it. The crew that was able to be alert and keep on top of the airplane did well. And for folks who aren't that familiar with the aircraft from that area, uh, from, from that era, uh, an FB-111 sits over on the oval now on the traffic yes. circle, one of two planes, the other a, a, a B-47 47. bomber. That's correct. Uh, but uh, so if they've never seen a, an FB-111, they can see that as they go around the traffic circle there. And one of those bizarre coincidences in life, when I went through my logbook here several years ago, I discovered that my last flight in any FB-111 was in that particular airplane that's out there on the traffic oval. Oh, really? That was uh, tell number 286, and uh, I think my last flight in it was in August of 1989. What's that like now to drive by that? From time to time. Well, probably well, every day you probably <laughs> drive by it. Yeah, we knew it was on static display there, but I hadn't realized it was the one where I had my last flight in. What's it like? It's pretty much like driving by any airplane. <laughs> so it's been 20 years now. As, as people look back, um, obviously uh, for many it was a surprise that the, uh, that the base closed in, in 1995. And, and the area went through transition and, and, uh, and uh, over the past 20 years, uh, there's been a mix of industry and housing on the old base and on the new base. Bombardier came in to the to the fringe. There's the new airport that's expanding. Do you think talking to your to your friends, to your colleagues from the from the Air Force in those days, people who have remained in the community, do they think the area has has recovered from from the loss of the Air Force base? It's recovered, but in different ways. It's uh, from my perspective. I do see a lot of the new uses that have been made of uh, base facilities. They're now 20 years along. They're now, tw they're now 20 years along. What we're not seeing are some of the developments we may have hoped that were that was going to come in. The uh, large Canadian aerospace firm that was going to come in um, apparently now has, if not completely fallen through, is so tenuous that we don't need to speak anymore. <laughs> Laurentian, <laughs> Laurentian, that we don't need to that speak, maintenance facility speak that was anymore promising about a thousand jobs. Yeah. That was, that was a good uh, promise and a good thing to uh, hope for. Haven't seen that one come through. But the uh, facilities that are still in use, the uh, subsidiary, subsidiaries for, for Bombardier and other ones seem to be doing well. Uh, will, we, will those facilities and those jobs replace the hundreds of uh, civilian jobs that were lost when the Air Force left at the same pay, sc pay scales? Probably not. Yeah, it was a huge blow at the time. About 10,000 military personnel and their families, and not to mention, uh, obviously, hundreds and hundreds of civilian jobs tied yep, to Yep, I'm base. not remembering the exact numbers. I'm thinking we were talking someplace around 
four to 500 civilian jobs that went away, and like you say, approximately 10,000 uh, Air Force uh, jobs. Some of the things that uh, come to mind with losing that big chunk of people that have affected the area in ways you wouldn't have thought of is with the Air Force here, the uh, community always received new people coming in, staying here for a good period of time, and then, and then moving on. Mm. You had a flow of new blood, new thoughts, new ideas passing through the community and all those places where those uh, different military people would interact. Churches, schools, other civic organizations, uh, other, volunt other volunteer groups, they had a large uh, portion of basically new blood available mm. frequently. Yeah. And when the Air Force uh, left and the base closed, you no longer had that flow of people coming through the uh, North Country here and so you lost that bit of diversity you had on a routine basis of people flowing through uh, Plattsburgh and participating in, the, uh, participating in the local area. We also know that as those people were passing through the local area here, whether they were uh, airmen or uh, officers or even senior officers, those people uh, acted dynamically in the Plattsburgh area economy. You had people always buying cars, always buying dishwashers, always buying washing machines and dryers, all those types of things that families and individuals would need as they pass through the area. That pass through now, well, has been, has been gone for 20 years also, and I'm sure the local businesses who uh, were able to enjoy that pass through of folks making reasonably good p wages, but still passing through needing items, um, I'm sure that loss has been uh, very badly felt by uh, everything from car dealerships to, uh, to realtors. Yeah. In 1995, there were many feared that the, that it would be a knockout punch to the to the area and to the to the economy. Uh, as you mentioned, perhaps not a knockout punch, but certainly the the area had to redevelop itself and and maybe uh, come up with a new I identity. It did not it did not immediately draw in related industry, aerospace industry, and and such that uh, perhaps could have retained a large number of people and it, it, there was a definitely a change you know, to the to the area yes it was you know the original hopes were gee we have lots of hangars here on the airbase wouldn't it be great if an if an aerospace leader came in and was able to utilize those facilities hmm. didn't quite work out that way but you know we still remain a transportation hub with both uh, at bombardier as you mentioned here but also uh, nova bus where you are still seeing the area used by an, I'm not gonna say an outside group, but a group that wasn't originally indigenous to this area here. You have Canadian firms, both Bombardier and uh, Novabus, who've entered the area here as a gateway to uh, the US market, and by providing uh, jobs here in the area have uh, been able to take up some of the slack that the air base uh, uh, took away when it left. When the air base closed, the museum closed, it did. And that was a sad day for a number of people. And for many years, uh, folks have worked to reopen that museum. And you've done that. Uh, last year, uh, the Plattsburgh Air Force Base Museum was reopened, um, or a new museum opened in its place. Uh, how much work has, has gone into that, and how gratifying is it to, uh, to see that museum reopened? Well, we're uh, part of the uh, Battle of Plattsburgh Association's War of 1812 group. We're under uh, their state charter, so by being an umbrella orga orga organization, or having them as an umbrella organization over us, that let us have the mechanisms we needed to do, we needed to have to start a museum. Once uh, the idea was uh, germinated, and I'm gonna give Keith Herkelo, the president of the Battle of Plattsburgh Association, full credit for coming up with the idea, and uh, proposing it uh, basically based upon people driving up and saying, where's the Air Force Base Museum? Where's the Air Force Base Museum? They, people would visit the area here as tourists remembering where the Air Base Museum was. Well, for years, the Battle of Plattsburgh Association's War of 1812 Museum was in that building, but that wasn't what the tourists who had time here were looking for. They were looking for an Air Base Museum. So several of us got together and nodded our heads, said, you know, I think we can do this. And like any museum who's starting from scratch, you need uh, two things, items to put on display and the funds to develop the facility to put them on display. We were able to run a, a membership uh, campaign for a lifetime, annual, and uh, 
just basic, uh, basic visitors who gave us enough uh, money along with a generous grant from the Association of Air Force Missileers who were involved in Plattsburgh since Plattsburgh used to be home to Atlas Missiles. Uh, thanks to their generous grant, we were able to now develop the museum. It was wonderful to go around and let people know that, hey, we're putting the museum together. Can you help us out with stuff you've got? I'm imagining many attics got cleaned out by uh, folks <laughs> who went into their old Air Force flight bags and said, hey, here's my helmet, here's my flight jacket, here's my checklist, here's my, um, here's my flashlight, here's my uh, mission guide, here's my maps, here's my knee board, uh, here's my uniform that I wore when I worked on the SRAM missiles here. Here's the uniform I wore when I was a security police officer here. Here was the uniform I wore when I was a woman in the Air Force here in the 19, uh, 1950s. The all telling the story in the history. All, all telling the story in the history. The um, most interesting item we received by people just walking in and say, I've got something that I think you might be interested in um, happened, oh, it wasn't this past June, but the previous June when we had only been open for a month. Several school groups came through. One school group came through from the city of Plattsburgh. In that school group was probably a second or third grader who said, you know, my grandpa's got a bomb in his garage. And we're thinking to ourselves, sure, he's got a <laughs> bomb in his garage. But, you know, you never know. So we told him, well, if your grandfather would like to share what he's got with the museum, why don't you have, it bring, why don't you have him bring it by? We figured we would never see anybody. Yeah. Sure enough, but the next week, doesn't grandpa pull up in his pickup truck with a practice dummy bomb in the back of his truck. It was a 750-pound uh, Air Force bomb training shape. It only weighs maybe just over 100 pounds or so, but there it was, and it was painted blue, the Air Force uh, color for inert uh, bombs. You could see it didn't have a fuse up in the nose, yeah. so we knew the thing from uh, its weight and uh, size and shape had been a practice uh, bomb, and gosh, didn't Grandpa put on a uh, rub-on uh, transfers for U.S. Army, of all things, on the back end, <laughs> and a shark mouth on the front. But you know, we got it, we put it in our museum collection, if for nothing else, to make the point with folks who come through that you never know what somebody has that has a connection to Plattsburgh Air Force Base that would make a truly unique display. Mm -hmm. And folks have donated dozens, if not hundreds of items? Yes, that's, that's exactly true. Our most uh, recent thing, uh, we received uh, as of, gosh, this past weekend, was someone who was here right toward the bitter end was given a plaque that on the plaque has a brass plaque explaining that, uh, yep, they were one of the folks who put the lock on Plattsburgh Air Force Base, hmm. and above that on the plaque is a hasp with a padlock through it. Hmm. He was presented this as a token of the air of the air base group's um, appreciation for being some of the being one of the last people assigned to Plattsburgh before leaving and literally putting the lock on the gate as they left. Were there enough items left over still from 20 years ago that you were able to to save? There wasn't save? one item left. There was not a single item left. Everything when the base closed was either transferred to the National Museum of the United States Air Force down in Dayton, mm -hmm. Ohio or transferred to uh, other Air Force uh, record keeping sections, either at Maxwell Air Force Base uh, or whatever. Not a, not a single thing left. That makes it hard as organizers to start from scratch. It made it hard, but like we said, we had a lot of help. Our local plastic uh, modelers group here, the International Plastic Modeler Society Champlain Valley Chapter, built us model aircraft in the same scale of uh, each of the models. So now we have a B-47 model, KC-97 tanker model, KC-135 tanker model, B-52G model, FB-111, and an Atlas missile model that are all in the same relative scale so people can get appreciation for the relative sizes of these uh, different instruments that used to be here. The great thing is this happened in the age of Facebook, social media. How big was that in reaching out to people across the country to say that we're we are opening a museum, and, and if you have items, we would we would love to display them. Well, we actually got our Facebook page open after the museum opened. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so all, social media didn't help us all that much in getting the uh, museum open, only because we were a latecomer to, to uh, social media. But yes, the Plattsburgh Air Force Base Museum does have its own Facebook page, not to be confused with the Plattsburgh Air Force Base Facebook page. Okay, They're both out there. It's a tight-knit community, though, so when you put out the word that we're opening a museum, 
you heard from a lot of people who had been stationed here who, yes, who many, offered you items. Man, many of us have that ever popular group email address that we created of friends we knew in the Air Force. Uh, there was an FB 111 association that uh, gets together annually. As a matter of fact, the reason I don't have other people sitting here with me is they're all returning from that reunion that was this past, uh, this past weekend. So we were able to uh, draw upon uh, their resources, uh, other uh, groups that, re that we were able to reach routinely. Um, a lot of the 380th uh, Organizational Maintenance Squadron folks have uh, reunions here. We were able to uh, work with them. One of the unusual folks uh, was the 556 Strategic Missile Squadron. Uh, they are still alive and uh, kicking. People who used to pull alert here with the Atlas missiles 50 years ago, they were able to donate uh, several items uh, from the Atlas missile era here that we oh. never would have expected seeing. We have a doorbell from an Atlas missile uh, 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 entry port. We have a uh, flash detector that was designed to detect the flash of a nearby nuclear detonation and trigger an electronic signal that would close all the vents and ports on an Atlas uh, missile silo. Mm. So in theory, the blast as it went past uh, would clean everything off the top side, but not come down into the uh, launch facility or into the missile silo and overpressurize them and, and, and destroy them. Hmm. So we've, we, have, um, we have a few things from the uh, Atlas missile area here that, again, had no idea existed, but people were willing to share them with us. And that's fantastic to have them on display now. So for the visitor coming in, uh, it, it, it really presents to them a, a, a good uh, picture of what uh, life was like here in Plattsburgh Air Force Base and in the Atlas missile sites around the, the North Country. Yeah, we, we try to tell the story of, uh, as, you're, as you're visiting our museum, we have a timeline that shows significant events that happened every year during the times we were here. We have several of the trophies that uh, were won by Plattsburgh in Strategic Air Command uh, competitions throughout the years. Uh, in our main museum uh, area here, as I mentioned, we have the models of all the mm. aircraft and missiles that were here, but we also have a section that talks about Plattsburgh Air Force Base then and now by comparing period photos from when the base was open to photos that were taken this spring. And uh, comparing those, we have a, a section that talks about what was life like for bomber, tanker, security police, and maintenance folks on alert when the Strategic Air Command would put people on alert for about a, a week at a time. As we mentioned, we do have the section on the Atlas missile. We do have a section that talks about life in the community and life on base. And our final section talks about the Plattsburgh Air Base uh, Liaison Committee, the group of local civic leaders and business uh, folks who uh, helped Plattsburgh Air Force Base during all the years that were open and uh, became parts of everything from our honorary commander program, where folks would be selected to be the honorary commander of a uh, base squadron and participate in squadron life uh, as um, as a way to show them a little bit of thanks for their aid to do those things for Plattsburgh Air Force Base that Plattsburgh Air Force Base couldn't do for itself. For example, as you're driving around the uh, traffic roundabout, yes, you see the B-47 and the FB-111 sitting there, but you'll also see several lovely gracing stainless steel arcs with uh, uh, aircraft figures at the, uh, at the end of them. Those were all bought and paid for by the Air Base Liaison Committee as recognition for the various different uh, competition awards that Plattsburgh won, everything from the Fairchild Trophy for the best bombing and ta uh, tanker uh, 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 competition to the best bombers to the best tankers. Yeah. And we received uh, rewards, uh, several awards in uh, those different competitions that the Air Base Liaison Committee sprung loose their funds to uh, uh, put a visible, a visible sign of the award up. And those are still there too. Those are still there too in the Clyde Lewis Air Park. Volunteers are a big part of, of what you do. You're the curator of the museum, but you count on volunteers to staff it. Oh yeah, we, as a matter of fact, uh, we use volunteers to staff our museum every day that we're open. And okay, here, here comes a shameless plug. <laughs> we're open uh, Wednesdays through Saturdays, May through uh, the end of October, from uh, 10 in the morning to three in the afternoon. You'll always have a volunteer guide there. Sometimes I'll be the volunteer guide, but I'm not the only volunteer guide there. We have at least about a half a dozen other folks who all take turns uh, volunteering, opening the museum and sharing their experiences, either at Plattsburgh Air Force Base or in other Air Force assignments mm -hmm. uh, with folks. Um, even Father Clyde Lewis, the son of Clyde Lewis, the, 
the linchpin of, of Plattsburgh is one of our uh, volunteers and takes a turn there at least once a, once a month. And for the folks who are listening, our, our listeners on the radio, uh, where can they find out more information about the Plattsburgh Air Force Museum? Do you, you have a website and a Facebook page? We've got a Facebook page and most of our information is uh, there. There's some information on the War of 1812 Museum's uh, website, but we've mm -hmm. decided that the Air Base Museum will use Facebook as our, as our primary communications tool. And that's uh, www.facebook.com? Yep, and just query Plattsburgh Air Force Base Museum. All spelled out. All spelled out, and you'll, that'll take you directly to our page. Make sure you include the word museum, otherwise you'll get the Plattsburgh Air Force Base mm -hmm. Facebook page. And for folks that may be new to the area, or are thinking of coming to visit, uh, what, what do you hope they take away from a, from a visit to the museum? Well, what we're hoping they're able to take away is a bit of an appreciation for what a uh, military presence in a local area uh, could do for both the military and, and for the uh, local area. We'd like folks to have an appreciation for what, a little bit what life was like if you were a military member here on the base, a little bit on uh, what kind of equipment did uh, did, uh, did you folks uh, use? The um, touch table we have open invites the viewer to pick up and touch those things that they've only seen in movies. You can put on a B-52 crew member's helmet. Mm. You can put on an FB-111 crew member's helmet. You can pick up their flashlight and see if the batteries still work. You can get an appreciation for, gee, what is in this checklist that told them everything they had to do or could want to do or needed to do in an emergency in, in the airplane? You can get a little bit of an appreciation for what was like life like for both the military member in the uh, local community and a little bit less so what was life like, life like for the local community with the air base there. And why is it so important to keep that history alive? Well, you know, the Champlain Valley here has a strong military history tradition going all the way back to the time when Benedict Arnold was a good guy. With uh, the uh, participation in the American Revolution, War of 1812, Major Ulysses S. Grant was stationed here at one, at, uh, one point in time before his uh, Civil War rise to his, uh, his uh, generalship. Most of the uh, brick buildings here on Plattsburgh Air Base were built during the time of the uh, Spanish-American War. My oldest uncle came through Plattsburgh before he went overseas during World War I. Uh, during World War II, of course, we had uh, a military presence here with Cap Camp McDonough for the, uh, for the Navy, plus some uh, hospital facilities that were here. Then, of course, we continued on the military presence when uh, the Plattsburgh Air Force Base was here from when it opened in 1955 to when it closed in 1995. The way it worked out was that Platts, the Plattsburgh area, and I'm going to call it Plattsburgh Air Force Base, had the longest continuous military presence of any place in the United States except for West Point at the time it closed. Can't, can, can't continue that claim now, but uh, even now portions of the air base are still used for national defense. Maybe it's just uh, Customs and Border Patrol with, an air, with a small air detachment here, but people are still flying out of uh, Plattsburgh in the defense of the United States. And for Keith Herculo, you and, and other folks who, who had been stationed here, and this is, this is part of your career path, uh, you felt very strongly about reopening the museum to... to, to yes, I did. Yes, I did. As a matter of fact, I, I was the guy who got the call from Keith saying, what would you think about us opening up a Plattsburgh Air Force Base Museum? I remember sitting down with him and turned out to be in the Common Council Chambers at City Hall when Keith was still working as the uh, city clerk and mm -hmm. we batted forth, uh, back and forth a couple ideas and I explained to Keith in great detail why this could never work. <laughs> For you and others, obviously a sense of pride to have this open again. It's nice, to have it, it's nice to have it open again if for no other reason we're able to share with folks who come through the door our experiences at Plattsburgh. When you come right down to it, the word history ends in the word story. You will hear a story or two when you drop into the Plattsburgh Air Force Base Museum from somebody who was there or from somebody who was at a place like Plattsburgh. Frank Barry, thank you very much for taking the time to be with us. You're very welcome. Thanks for inviting me.